Hello and welcome live from New Delhi. You're watching DD India News R, India's voice to the world. I'm Gautam Roy, and coming up in the next hour, divers recover data recorder from the ship which downed the Baltimore Bridge. Six missing workers presumed dead. U.S. President Joe Biden hails the Indian crew, which alerted the authorities. New Delhi summons U.S. diplomat over the State Department's remarks about legal proceedings in India, says nations should respect the sovereignty and internal affairs of others. India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar calls on the Malaysian Prime Minister in Kuala Lumpur after his Singapore and Philippines visits, conveys Prime Minister Narendra Modi's greetings. And Thailand's lower house clears a bill giving legal status to same-sex marriage, but it still needs an approval from the Senate and a royal endorsement to become law. First up, let's get you the latest on the bridge collapse in the Baltimore in the United States. Investigators from America's National Transport Safety Board, or NTSB, are reported to have recovered the data recorder of the container ship, which crashed into the bridge, bringing it down into the icy waters. This recovery will help probe the reason why the ship lost power and steering suddenly and couldn't be stopped from ramming into the bridge. Here's all which has been unfolding in the aftermath of the mishap. It was precisely 1.28 a.m. ET or 5.28 a.m. GMT on Tuesday when a large part of the Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge went crashing down into the Patapsco River after being rammed by a container ship called Dali, which had suffered a sudden loss of power. After hours of searching where two survivors were rescued, the authorities announced that they were suspending the search for the six missing workers who had been repairing parts of the bridge when it came down. At this point, as the Admiral said, we're going away from the search and rescue portion to a recovery operation. The changing conditions out there have made it dangerous for the first responders, the divers in the water. We will still have surface ships out overnight at 0600 hours tomorrow. We are hoping to put divers in the water and begin a more detailed search to do our very best to recover those six missing people. The death toll could have been much higher, but for a call made by one of the 22 Indian crew members from the container ship just two minutes before the collision. They reported a loss of propulsion shortly before impact and dropped anchor to slow the vessel, giving transportation authorities time to halt traffic on the bridge before the crash. Personnel on board the ship were able to alert the Maryland Department of Transportation that they had lost control of their vessel, as you all know and reported. As a result, local authorities were able to close the bridge to traffic before the bridge was struck, which undoubtedly saved lives. Divers returned to the waters on Wednesday morning at daybreak to take the recovery efforts forward with improved visibility underwater. Another concern is to get the halted operations at the Baltimore port up and running again as it directly supports 15,000 jobs directly and nearly 140,000 indirectly. Authorities say even the bridge saw an average of 35,000 vehicles crossing it every day. President Biden assured that his government will pay all the expenses for rebuilding the bridge. It's my intention that federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. And I expect to, the Congress to support my effort. Mystery still shrouds the exact cause of the mishap. Wednesday saw investigators from the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board boarding the ship that crashed into the bridge and recovered its data recorder. NTSB Chair Jennifer Homendy was reported as saying that the recorder will be analyzed and the agency will also examine where the dirty fuel played a role in the ship's power loss as part of its investigation. Bureau Report, DD India. Let's get you more on this live from Baltimore with DD India's Caroline Malone. Good evening, Caroline. Now, six construction workers have been presumed dead, but is there any update on the recovery efforts being made by divers so that the workers' families can at least have closure? 
Well, absolutely. So those divers at daybreak were able to get back into the water, but they are working in very difficult conditions. We're talking about water that's about eight degrees Celsius. There's heavy currents and of course there's debris in the water around the bridge, around where that ship collided with the bridge that makes conditions incredibly difficult for them to really find these um, six bodies of the construction workers who are presumably dead now and in the water somewhere. You know, there's also the chance, of course, that with the currents that those bodies could move further away. So very challenging conditions to try and find the bodies, but of course, incredibly important because of closure for the families uh, to try and get them and help them to move on to the next phase. You know, officials and the governor um, have actually visited with the families, the relatives of these workers who we believe have passed in this incident, offering their condolences and also making a bigger gesture to some of the workers at the port. We believe about 15,000 people are usually employed in the port at the port of Baltimore. And because of this accident, no major ships have been able to come in and out for a couple of days and port operations have been stalled. And so officials are saying, we are going to help sus subsidize the pay for these workers. We're going to try and help support the workers at the port uh, because of this horrible tragedy and the fact that they won't be able to get income otherwise. Yes, sir, that is uh, thoughtful indeed. Now, has the NTSB, which is probing the accident, indicated as to how soon can they clear the air on what caused the collision and collapse after recovering the data recorded this morning? Well, overall, this type of investigation is huge. They will be looking at every single detail of what happened in the timeline leading up to the crash that led to the bridge coming down. They'll be looking at all the ship's history. They'll be going through all the safety records. They'll be speaking to the management company. They'll be speaking to the crew and also the pilot that was on board at the time. Crucially, though, they have recovered the black boxes from the ship. They were waiting until the rescue efforts were finished before they moved on the ship. They have now done that on Wednesday. And these black boxes have important data. And they say by the end of Wednesday, they hope to have at least a basic timeline from that information, from those black boxes that give them a sense at least of the final moments of the ship. And of course, in those final moments from videos, we could see that a lot was happening, that potentially the power was cut on the ship. We saw the electrics go off and on. So it is clear that something absolutely malfunctioned at a huge level. Uh, so they will be able to get that information potentially as early as the end of Wednesday. But in terms of the wider investigation, we're talking months, a year, maybe even a year and a half, according to the lead investigator. Because there's a speculation around dirty fuel as well, which led to uh, this uh, power failure. Well, the lead investigator um, has not specified about that in particular at the moment. Um, she's basically said that they will explore all avenues, but that that is, you know, not something that's been confirmed by officials at all at this point. Certainly there has been some speculation about that, uh, but that is one of the many factors that will be looked at. You know, in the wider picture, though, this bridge was built in the 1970s. That's, you know, a 50 year old bridge. That's true of a lot of the infrastructure across the United States, particularly the bridges that are older. They've been in place for decades. But container ships have really evolved over the decades. In those times, they were much smaller, much narrower. And so it was easier for them to get through this type of port. We're now talking about container ships like this one, the Dali, that was nearly a thousand foot long. And there are container ships that usually go through this bay into the port of Baltimore that are much, much bigger. So really, we're looking at, you know, infrastructure that potentially needs to be upgraded, that potentially needs to be able to handle this type of massive ship. And that is something that investigators say they'll look at as well. They're going to study if and when this bridge is rebuilt, whether it should be rebuilt in a different way. All right, because President Biden has said that uh, the U.S. federal government will pay for rebuilding this bridge, but it uh, won't really happen overnight. That much is evident. Now, have the authorities indicated by when will they be able to get the port of Baltimore up and running again? Yeah, that's another big challenge, isn't it? It could take, you know, a long time to be able to be in a position to even move the ship ultimately. I mean, right now the ship is tangled up with the bridge. With those recovery efforts for the bodies going on, they're not going to be wanting to move anything at the moment. So they want to make sure that they do everything they can with the recovery process first before they then move on to try and get the debris, get the bridge out of the water. That could then take a year, maybe years to rebuild this bridge. 
And at that point, you've still got this port that is essentially not able to function in the way that it usually does. I mean, we're talking about a busy waterway here behind me where you usually have big container ships coming in and out. That's clearly not um, possible to happen at the moment. We've got 15,000 workers whose jobs are on the line. Uh, we've also got huge amounts of trade coming in and out of this port. Something like 750,000 um, automobiles came in and out of Baltimore just one year, just last year alone. So big car companies are also quite cautious now about what's going to happen. Some of them are already looking to move their trade, their movement of cars to other ports, some of them going to the port of Virginia, which is just south of here. But yes, there's going to be a, a likely knock-on effect, not just the city of Baltimore, potentially the whole U.S., and also big, uh, big impact on trade in the world. Yes, uh, quite a disrupting incident uh, then. Uh well, let's hope that uh, we get to the bottom of it as soon as possible and then perhaps uh, you know, one can uh, move on from uh, that to rebuilding things, uh, which is another ball game altogether. Thanks a lot for joining us for the moment, Caroline Miller. Now, in his external affairs, Minister Dr. S.J. Shankar is in Malaysia on the final leg of his three-nation visit to Southeast Asian nations, which also included visiting Singapore and the Philippines. The minister addressed the Indian community in Kuala Lumpur on Wednesday, appreciating their contribution to strengthening India-Malaysia ties. He also met the country's top leadership during the day. India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jai Shankar on the final leg of his three-nation Southeast Asian visit was in Malaysia on Wednesday. Addressing the Indian community in Kuala Lumpur, Dr. Jai Shankar appreciated the contribution of the Indian diaspora in the development of Malaysia. He said that India-Malaysia relations are being taken to the next level. India and Malaysia, we are poised uh, to take our relationship to the next level. I think very serious conversations are happening among policymakers to that end. But uh, anything like this requires the full support of society, uh, especially in countries where we have this kind of living bridge uh, between us. Uh, all of you, in some way or the other, can contribute to it in your particular professions, in your walk of life. You can also make a difference adding to this relationship. And that is why you have seen uh, today how open we are, uh, how appreciative we are uh, of the contribution of the diaspora. Wednesday also saw Dr. Jai Shankar calling on the country's Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. During the meeting, the minister conveyed the greetings of Prime Minister Narendra Modi to him and appreciated the Malaysian leader's vision for stronger India-Malaysia ties. The minister further noted that he benefited from PM Ibrahim's guidance and insights on regional developments. Dr. S. Jai Shankar began his visit by meeting Malaysian counterpart Mohammad Haji Hassan earlier on Wednesday. Tuesday saw India's external affairs minister reiterating India's support for upholding the sovereignty of the Philippines at a joint news conference with his Filipino counterpart. I take this opportunity to firmly reiterate India's support to the Philippines for upholding its national sovereignty. As the world changes, it is essential that countries like India and the Philippines cooperate more closely to shape the emerging order. Overall, the External Affairs Minister's visit to Southeast Asian nations of Singapore, Philippines and Malaysia underscores India's efforts for regional stability and security, shaping the geopolitical landscape of the region. Bureau Report, DD India. And still to come on DD India News, huh? India summons you as Deputy Chief of Mission in Delhi over recent State Department remarks related to certain court proceedings. The latest on the Great Indian Elections on a day which saw several top leaders filing their nomination papers to become members of Parliament. And the Japanese yen tanks to its lowest level against the US dollar in 34 years. A draconian national security law. Has democracy died in Hong Kong? Was there a secret weapon behind the mysterious Havana syndrome that shook American diplomacy?
And the last decade was the hottest ever. Is our planet on the brink? Watch Connecting the Dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 p.m. IST on DD India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Gautam Roy. The Delhi High Court has rejected Arvind Kejriwal's interim relief plea, where the Delhi Chief Minister has questioned his arrest by the Enforcement Directorate in connection with the alleged excise policy scam. Instead, the court has issued notice to the Enforcement Directorate to respond to Kejriwal's petition by the 3rd of April. The court said it's mindful of the fact that whether the petitioner is entitled to immediate release or not, a decision on this will be based on the issues raised in the main petition itself. The Delhi CM was arrested by the ED on the 21st of March. A Delhi court had remanded him to the probe agency's custody till Thursday. Let's get you more on this uh, from DD India's Vikas Sarthi, who followed the proceedings in the court in Delhi today. Good evening to you, Vikas. Does the court's decision mean that Arvind Kejriwal will have no chance of getting out of custody till at least the 3rd of April? Or can he seek relief from the Supreme Court here? Uh, good evening, Gautam. In fact, not only till 3rd, but it seems that in the coming weeks, he is it is very unlikely that he get he will get any kind of relief either from the lower court, high court, or even from the Supreme Court, since we are aware that uh, the sections under which he has been booked, which is Prevention of Money Laundering Act, uh, the bail provisions are quite uh, are quite uh, strict in fact uh, there are two conditions which has to be fulfilled uh, in a, in case of a bail the first is that the public prosecutor must not oppose the bail of an accused like we have seen in the in cases where the uh, where the accused have become have become approver of the ed so that was the first condition where public prosecutor himself uh, is not uh, does, doesn't oppose and doesn't oppose the bail application and the second is that court is convinced that prime of hi uh, the case doesn't stand uh, the scrutiny of the court. So both these conditions are quite strict and it seems that in the coming weeks also Arvind Kejriwal may not get any kind of relief from the high court as well as from the superior courts. Uh, he will have to remain in the first in the ED custody and later in the judicial custody. It seems we have seen in the past as well the co-accused uh, witness same fish. So that may be the case for Arvind Kejriwal as well, Gautam. All right. Now there's been some political turmoil over Kejriwal's arrest ever since it uh, happened. What about the fate of the Delhi government itself in terms of uh, will it continue to be run by someone who's behind bars? Well, Gautam, there are three aspects of this particular issue. First is political, second is moral stand and the third is legal position. As far as the legal position is concerned, there are no impediments or there are not, they are not bar of any kind unless a person is convicted in a serious crime. He is he's capable to hold his uh, office as an MLA and as well as a minister unless he is convicted by a court. Uh, the second issue uh, is of the practical problems like uh, how he will he is going to hold cabinet meetings, how he will issue certain orders which are required to be passed by the chief minister from time to time. Uh, as far as the political stand is concerned, Aam Aadmi Party uh, has been claiming that Arvind Kejriwal will continue as chief minister but there are certain practical problems with that, that how he's going to hold cabinet decision. Apart from it, now the uh, moral question, in fact, we have seen in the past that other, uh, uh, other ministers in the same government uh, were forced to resign uh, when they were when they were accused of similar kind of, uh, uh, of charges under PMLA Act. So those uh, members, were, those ministers were forced to resign. But now Amadbi party is claiming that Arvind Kejriwal will continue as chief minister, though practically it seems not quite possible uh, because of certain certain uh, practical problems. Uh, the other issue is uh, some PILs and some petitions have been filed in courts, particularly in Delhi High Court, where it has been alleged that since he is accused of uh, of a of, uh, of an economic offence, so he should not continue as Chief Minister of Delhi. That petition will be taken up by the Delhi High Court tomorrow itself, and we will be able to know whether court issues any kind of directions. Since there is no particular bar on holding post, uh, but practical problems, moral questions, and the political stand which have uh, Aam Aadmi Party has taken in the past. These three are the, um, are the main issues which are related to, the, to your question. Gautam. Then, of course, uh, the question that if not Arvind Kejriwal, then who? And uh, there's been speculation on that as well. But till now, the AAP is holding strong that Arvind Kejriwal will continue as Chief Minister of Delhi, although 
practically it does seem quite an uphill task. Thanks for joining us for the meantime, Vikas Sarthi. Uh, India has strongly objected to the remarks of the U.S. State Department spokesperson about certain legal proceedings in India. In a statement, India's Ministry of External Affairs said, and I quote, In diplomacy, states are expected to be respectful of the sovereignty and internal affairs of others. This responsibility is even more so in case of fellow democracies. It could otherwise end up setting unhealthy precedents. India's legal processes are based on an independent judiciary which is committed to objective and timely outcomes. Casting aspersions on that is unwarranted. On Wednesday, U.S.'s acting Deputy Chief of Mission Gloria Berbena was uh, summoned by the ministry in Delhi. The meeting lasted approximately 45 minutes. And for more on this, uh, we're joined by DD India's Amitpal Singh, who is the person who covers the Indian Foreign Ministry for uh, the organization. Good evening to you, Amrit. Uh, India and the U.S. otherwise enjoy friendly and wide-ranging ties. Now, what has happened in this case that it led to a U.S. Deputy Chief of Mission being summoned to the Foreign Ministry? Uh, so, Gautam, what happened was that yesterday on Tuesday, uh, the U.S. State Department spokesperson told Reuters that uh, you know they were monitoring the arrest of Arvind Kejriwal. And uh, they, uh, you know, he uh, said that uh, the, he encourages India uh, to ensure that a timely and a fair a process, a legal process, is followed in his case. Now, India took strong uh, exception to that. They called uh, Gloria Babena, uh, the U.S. acting uh, deputy chief of mission, this morning. To, uh, they summoned her in the morning to uh, uh, the Ministry of External Affairs and told her in uh, no uncertain uh, terms in a meeting which lasted for about 40, 45 minutes, that India uh, does not accept that. It's unwarranted. Uh, these comments are unwarranted. India sees that as an affront to its sovereignty. And, uh, you know, uh, fellow democracies should not uh, interfere in internal affairs of other countries. And uh, this sets an unhealthy precedent. Now, you know, giving, using these words, setting an un this sets an unhealthy precedent also has an undertone of uh, a slight verbal threat that what if we start uh, speaking on the internal affairs of your country. So uh, it was very, very strongly worded, uh, given the fact that uh, the U.S. had made certain comments last month about uh, the citizen changes to the citizenship law, where India had just uh, hadn't summoned uh, the diplomats, but had said that these, uh, uh, this was uh, misplaced, uh, misinformed and unwarranted. So clearly, uh, you know, in, in a run up to that, uh, uh, the, these uh, strong words were expressed and strong exception was expressed to the United States that it is uh, unacceptable to India uh, that the U.S. Uh, interferes in its uh, uh, internal affairs and uh, asserted that India has an independent judiciary which is very capable of dealing uh, with uh, such legal procedures. And but, something similar happened with the Germans as well. That's right, uh, Gautam. The Germans had made similar comments saying that a fair, impartial probe must, be, uh, um, uh, must take place in this matter. So the German envoy was summoned too, and uh, he was uh, conveyed similar sentiments that uh, India sees it as an affront uh, to its sovereignty and interference uh, in its internal affairs, which is uh, completely unacceptable. Right. right. Now, in, in, in this particular case between India and the U.S., is it safe to presume that this will be a closed chapter now between the two nations? That's a good question. Uh, you know, given the strong, uh, um, you know, uh, communication or uh, strong remarks that have been conveyed to the U.S., one would understand that the State Department would factor that in. Uh, but as you know, U.S. is heading for elections. They have their domestic constituencies to keep, uh, to pander to, uh, especially the Democrats. Uh, you know, they are seen as uh, uh, liberals who make uh, statements on uh, um, uh, you know, religious freedoms of minorities and uh, uh, democratic processes, not just in their home, uh, uh, in their country, but abroad where they have uh, sizable uh, populations who could be voters there. So uh, one wouldn't, uh, you know, if uh, similar statements do come up in the run up to the elections, I, for one, wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, it has been very, very strongly conveyed to the U.S. So the it will surely weigh upon the administration that... Uh, India has taken strong exceptions, and if, it, uh, if the U.S. wants to go ahead with a friendly relations with India, it needs to tone down these comments. All but right. 
Well, let's uh, leave it there at the moment and let's uh, hope that it does get left there itself. Thanks a lot for joining us, Amritpal Singh. And now let's get you the latest on what's happening in India in the run-up to the world's largest democratic elections. Well, election fever has gripped India with just about a little more than two weeks left for the first phase of polling to begin in the country. The political parties have begun their campaigns with the full might across several states. Here's a comprehensive report by TD India's Dipendu Mondal. The first phase of polling for the general elections of 2024 to begin on the 19th of April. Wednesday marked the last day for nomination for the first phase. All contesting candidates queued up to file their nomination from their respective seats. Union ministers Nitin Gadkari and Bhupendra Yadav filed his nomination from the Nagpur and Alwar parliamentary constituencies in Maharashtra and Rajasthan respectively. While former Chief Minister of Tripura, Biplav Deb filed his nomination from the Tripura West parliamentary constituency seat on Wednesday. While in the political corridors of Punjab, the Aam Admi Party has received a double setback when two of their senior leaders joined the BJP on Wednesday. AAP Member of Parliament from Punjab's Jalandhar, Shushil Kumar Rinku and the party's MLA from Jalandhar West, Sheetal Angural, joined the BJP. Aam Admi Party ke ek matar Lok Sabha Sarasya 2019 case mein rahe. और आज वो भारतीय जनता पार्टी में प्रवेश कर रहे और वैसे ही शीतल जी जो आम आदमी पार्टी के विधानसभा सदस्य हैं और प्रवक्ता हैं इनका आना ये हम पार्टी के लिए एक अच्छी बात मानते हैं पंजाब के लिए मजबूती की बात मानते हैं और मैं उनका स्वागत करता हूं in the run up to the election the bjp also put out the list of star campaigners for the election who will be touring the entire country to campaign for the party. The BJP has listed Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Home Minister Amit Shah, Union Ministers and other senior leaders of the party as the star campaigners. On the other hand, the regional party, the Biju Janta Dal, released a list of nine candidates for the Lok Sabha polls in the state of Odisha. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is also set to hit the campaign ground ahead of the first phase of elections. Modi is likely to campaign for the BJP's candidate and former actor Arun Govil from Meerut in Uttar Pradesh on Sunday. The first phase of election will witness the largest polling phase in the seven-phase elections. On April 19th, 107 constituencies across 17 states and three union territories will go to polls, with thousands of candidates and hundreds of political party testing their popularity at the Hastings. Dibi and Dumondal's report for DD India. Along with that, the Congress party unveiled its seventh list of candidates for the upcoming general elections. The party has named four candidates from Chandigarh, including Devinder Singh Yadav, Biresh Thakur, Shashi Singh and Dr. Menka Devi Singh in this list. Advocate R. Sudha will contest from Mayana Duthurai in Tamil Nadu. And the Coimbatore Coimbatur constituency in the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu is set to witness a triangular contest. Tamil Nadu BJP chief K. N. M. L. I. has filed his nomination papers from Coimbatore on Wednesday in the presence of MLA Bharati Srinivas. Coimbatore, which is one of the 39 constituencies in Tamil Nadu, houses six assembly seats. And the AIADMK has filed G. Ramachandran, who filed his nomination papers on has fielded G. Ramachandran, who filed his nomination papers on Tuesday. The DMK has fielded former mayor of Coimbatore, Ganapati Rajkumar. Polling in Tamil Nadu's 39 parliamentary seats will be held in the first phase on just a single day on the 19th of April in an otherwise seven-phase general elections. And the Shiv Sena, led by Uddhav Thakre, has released its first list of 17 candidates for the upcoming elections to India's lower house of parliament. The party has fielded former union ministers Anand Gite from Raigarh, Arvind Saban from South Mumbai and Amol Kirtikar from Mumbai North West constituency. 
Alliance partner Congress has expressed displeasure over this candidature. Maharashtra, with 48 Lok Sabha seats, will vote in five phases beginning the 19th of April. Let me now take you across uh, to DD India's Aisha Khanum joining us from Bengaluru. Good evening to you, Aisha. I believe the Congress has been quite a hotbed of upheavals today in Karnataka. What has happened exactly and what more could be expected? Well, Gautam, uh, over five legislatures created a flutter, you know, when they announced their resignation and they said uh, that they were unhappy about the fact that uh, uh, K.H. Muniapa, uh, the Congress leader's family member, was getting a ticket uh, for Lok Sabha from Kolar district. Now, Kolar is a very important district. It's a backward uh, region and the seat is reserved for SCST, a particular uh, caste uh, community uh, representing SCST. So, uh, the, the MLAs were very upset about the fact that uh, this ticket is going to family member of K.S. Muniapa. Now, K.S. Muniapa's uh, daughter is already a, a legislator. She is an MLA here. K.S. Muniapa is a minister. So, uh, so, it was kind of justified the fact that, uh, you know, all the family members uh, from K.S. Muniapa's family are holding important posts and they are being given ticket. So, they were opposed to this. The MLAs were opposed to this and one was a minister who is a higher education minister who led this sudden flash rebellion in the Congress. So uh, they, they, they tried to uh, meet the speaker uh, to submit their resignation in a, a formal, a formal a format, but the uh, speaker was not available since he was traveling and he is he's in Mangalore right now. Uh, but uh, their resignations are put on hold now because the chief minister has assured them that their demand will be met. They will look into their demand for a consensus candidate in a Kola district. So, Chief Minister and the uh, Deputy Chief Minister, uh, D.K. Shiv Kumar, are trying to do the firefighting within the Congress because Congress is hugely uh, faction ridden here. And therefore, today's flash rebellion uh, has uh, come as a shock and a setback uh, to the Congress, uh, hoping uh, to you know perform well in the Lok Sabha election, uh, which is you know very, uh, which is still on a very weak wicket uh, considering the Lok Sabha numbers uh, they hold now because okay. the Congress had just one seat here. Uh, out of the 28 seats, the BJP has 25 seats. So the BJP is confident about the fact that they will repeat their performance and riding on the pro uh, Modi wave, uh, the pro development wave. Yes, let me ask you about the other camp as well. What's happening there in the ruling alliance? Is the situa situation equally turbulent there, or is it relatively smooth sailing in a build up to the final contest? Well, all is not well in, in, in uh, NDA as well, you know, the, the BJP and its uh, allies also are facing some hiccups because yesterday only the uh, regional BJP leader B.S. Yadurapa quelled a uh, rebellion in their own party in Davangire, which is the central, uh, central district of Karnataka. So uh, now he says that all is well and uh, he has managed to pacify them because this was also similar on similar grounds uh, that... Uh, uh, this rebellion occurred because uh, they didn't want another family member to get the ticket there. So right now, the BJP says that they are in, in control uh, of uh, such rebellion in the party and the BJP is uh, uh, in alliance with the Janta Dal Secular, another regional party which, is, which ha holds a fort in southern Karnataka. So the BJP is hopeful uh, that uh, with the alliance uh, with JDS, they will be able uh, to, uh, you know, break through in the regions where the BJP has not been successful so far. So, Mandia, from where uh, JDS leader Kumar Swami will be contesting, uh, is uh, one seat to look out for, wherein the BJP and JDS will put up a strong fight together in an alliance. And the Congress is fighting hard to save their fort uh, here in South Karnataka as well. So, at the moment, you know, there are... Uh, the situation in BJP as well, uh, there seem to be some turncoats, uh, uh, you know, moving from one party to other, crossing from party to uh, one party to the other party. And also today, another MLC from BJP, Dejaswini Gauda, also uh, quit the party because she was upset that she was not given a ticket. Okay. But the BJP hopes that all this will be, uh, you know, uh, controlled, uh, all this will be addressed once Prime Minister Narendra Modi will start his campaigning in Karnataka from April 4th onwards. We are told that there are about uh, 10 rallies that he will be conducting, he will be organizing in Karnataka and the BJP hopes that the Modi wave will sail them through and they will repeat the performance of 2019. All right, all right. Uh, let's see how things go. It's uh, early days yet as far as the campaigning is concerned and things are still settling down it seems in terms of uh, who gets to represent 
which seat, uh, for which party, uh, the choice of candidates, everything will settle down and then perhaps we'll have a better idea of which way things are going to go. Thanks a lot for joining us for the moment, Aisha Khanna. Now, voter awareness programs play a key role during elections. Now, this aims to guarantee that individuals are aware of their right to vote and that they use it responsibly. Take a look at this report. Uh, we will bring you that report as uh, soon as we have it lined up. Uh, but as far as uh, these elections are concerned, we've been telling you how the great Indian democratic elections are unfolding in the country because today was the last day of filing nominations for the first phase of the elections. Let's just look at what's being done to increase voter awareness as well. The Election Commission of India has the mandate to conduct elections to the various assemblies as well as the parliament of the nation. The task is much more than just the logistical preparation for the voting process. In fact, the ECI spends a considerable amount of time and attention to educate the voters for their rights. Various campaigns are launched regularly to evoke the spirit of democracy and the power of one vote. On the National Voters' Day on 25th January, ECI launched a national-level multimedia campaign to educate and raise awareness among voters for the upcoming 18th general elections to the lower house of the Indian Parliament. Titled Chunav Ka Parv, Desh Ka Garv or Elections, the biggest festival and pride of the nation. The campaign underscores the significance of elections as not only the largest celebration of democracy but also as a source of pride for individuals and the entire nation. <laughs> To fuel the spirit of voting even more, an anthem was also released by the Election Commission of India's Systematic Voters' Education and Electoral Participation or SWEEP program to enhance participation from all categories of voters under the organization's motto, No Voter to be Left Behind. Voter education and awareness is an essential part of the electoral process. The ECI aims to make voters aware of the power of a vote. Also, the Commission tries to inculcate a sense of belonging and ownership with the voters. It has striven to drive home the point that their participation in the election is crucial in order to guarantee a responsible, responsive and democratically elected government. Voter awareness involves electoral as well as civic education. The key aspects covered are election process, political parties and their manifestos, antecedents of candidates. Many educational institutions and organizations hold different activities like sporting events, essay writing contests, poster making competitions, marathons, etc. to raise awareness among people about voting. Various awareness efforts make the electoral process a national festival of celebrating one's choice and every citizen's understanding of their right as voters. Bureau Report, DD India. And still to come on DD India News are Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says cancellation of Israel's delegation's visit to Washington DC meant to show Hamas that Israel will not bend to any international pressure. China demands investigations into an attack by a suicide bomber that killed Chinese engineers working on a dam project in Pakistan. And the European Parliament, uh, its delegation is visiting Taiwan and discusses democracy as well as tensions in the Taiwan Strait.
where information shapes our reality. One app stands out, helps you stay ahead of time. Introducing the DD India app, your gateway to a world of news right at your fingertips. Your most trusted source of news goes global, goes digital. Explore a world of options, top stories, live updates, in-depth analysis and more. Stay informed wherever you are. Real-time alerts keep you ahead of the curve always. The DD India app connecting you to the world one story at a time. Download now and explore the world of knowledge, insights and authentic information. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Gautam Roy. Uh, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said that his cancellation of a planned visit to Washington, D.C. by top aides this week was meant to show Hamas that Israel will not bend to growing international pressure to halt the conflict in Gaza. Netanyahu's statement comes amid escalating tensions along the Israel-Lebanon border. As Lebanon's Hezbollah said, it launched 30 rockets at a northern Israeli town close to the Lebanese border early on Wednesday. Meanwhile, the U.S. has imposed sanctions on what it described as a fundraising network aligned with the Hamas. Here's the latest update. Tensions have again escalated along the Israel-Lebanon border on Wednesday after Hezbollah claimed it launched dozens of strikes at Kiryat Shmona, an Israeli town, in response to Israeli strikes on the village of Hebariya in southern Lebanon a day earlier. Israeli military said about 30 rockets were launched from Lebanon towards northern Israel on Wednesday, killing a factory worker. The Israeli military and the Iran-aligned Hezbollah, an ally of Hamas, have been engaging near daily fire across the border since October, when the current conflict in Gaza started. Both sides said they do not want all-out war and are open to a diplomatic process, but strikes have picked up this week after a lull in cross-border shelling. There's a crater in the middle of the street. There's damage here to an entire building and I'm one of the tenants. Force, only force, because there is no choice. That's what they want. That's what they are expecting and where they are directing at us. If I had returned here to Kiryat Shmona yesterday, there are six funerals today, six, not one, and it's very sad. Meanwhile, Israeli soldiers continued operations against Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorists holed up in Gaza City, Shifa Hospital and in Khan Yunus. Israel Defense Forces said that in the last 24 hours, soldiers eliminated terrorists and located terror infrastructure and weapons inside the hospital compound. Since entering the compound on March 18, Israel has killed over 180 terrorists and detained 800 terror suspects, of whom at least 500 have been confirmed as members of the Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad terror groups. True talks between Israel and Hamas fell through as Israel recalled its negotiations from Doha. Israel says Hamas's rejection of a current proposal for a Gaza truce deal with Israel shows the damage done by the UN Security Council resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire. The bad thing about the U.S. decision in the United Nations Security Council was that it encouraged Hamas to take a hard line and to believe uh, that international pressure will prevent Israel from a freeing the hostages and uh, destroying Hamas. And that, therefore, my decision not to send the delegation to Washington in the wake of that resolution was a message to Hamas. It was a message, first and foremost, to Hamas, don't bet on this pressure, it's not going to work. And I hope they got the message. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office said Israel would not surrender to what it called the Palestinian armed group's delusional demands. They include an end to the conflict and the complete withdrawal of Israeli forces. Dheeraj Das's report for DD India. And DD India's Sarah Coates gets us uh, more updates from Tel Aviv on the Israel-Hamas conflict. Well, Israeli operations are continuing right across the Gaza Strip, including down into the southernmost city of Rafa, where some 1.3 million internally displaced Palestinians are sheltering, with sources on the ground saying some 24 people have been killed in Rafa over the last 24 hours, with dozens of others wounded, as aid groups say the situation is overwhelmingly catastrophic. 
Well, it comes as international pressure is building on Israel to abandon plans to enter the city of Rafa with a full military incursion. The Defence Minister, Yoav Gallant, he's been meeting with his counterpart at the Pentagon, with Lloyd Austin calling on him to abandon these plans, saying the civilian death toll is already far too high. Meanwhile, tensions are also ratcheting up on Israel's northern border. Hezbollah sending over a volley of some 30 rockets a little earlier today into the town of Kiryat Shimona, which caused major damage to buildings and killed one man who was a construction worker aged around 25. Well, Hezbollah says that this was in response to a number of airstrikes in southern Lebanon overnight, which killed some seven people. It claims that they were emergency volunteer workers, but Israel says that they were terror operatives on their way to carry out cross-border terror activities. In Tel Aviv, Sarah Coates reporting for DD India. And with the ongoing conflict, uh, Spanish military planes airdropped 26 tons of humanitarian aid to Palestinians in the Gaza Strip on Wednesday, and Madrid called on Israel to open land border crossings. The operation carried out in coordination with Jordan and co-financed by the European Union dropped more than 11,000 food rations for the people. Other Western countries, including the United States, France and Germany, have also resorted to airdrops to deliver aid to ease the situation. The Spanish Foreign Ministry also reaffirmed its commitment to supporting UNRWA, the United Nations Humanitarian Agency for Palestinians, and to its continued existence. Israel says it puts no limit on the amount of humanitarian aid entering Gaza, and blames problems in it reaching civilians there on UN agencies, which it says are inefficient. With the escalating humanitarian crisis in Haiti, France sent out helicopters to evacuate some of its citizens from the Caribbean nation on Sunday. Despite the stopping of commercial flights to and from Port-au-Prince, an operation facilitated the evacuation of French citizens amidst escalating gang violence. About 1,500 French nationals are registered with the French embassy in Haiti. This comes after the United States and Canada also initiated the evacuation of some of their nationals last week. Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova on Wednesday expressed her doubt over the possibility of the Islamic State orchestrating the attack on a Moscow concert hall last Friday. This resulted in the death of at least 140 people. Despite the group claiming responsibility for the attack, Russian officials have consistently questioned the validity of Western intelligence reports attributing the attack to the Islamic State, proposing instead that Ukraine was behind it. The search and rescue work at the Crocus City Hall near Moscow has now concluded as Russia's President Vladimir Putin hoped that prosecutors would do everything to ensure the attackers would be justly punished. Russian investigators questioned the families of the four suspected gunmen of the attack on, in, in, in Tajikistan on Wednesday. The investigators said their relatives had been brought to the capital Dushanbe from their hometowns. On the 22nd of March, four gunmen opened fire at a concert hall near Moscow, in which 139 people lost their lives and 182 were injured. The Islamic State terrorists claimed responsibility for the attack. Russian oil firms are facing delays of up to several months to be paid for crude oil and fuel, as the banks in China, Turkey and the United Arab Emirates have become more wary of U.S. secondary sanctions. The banks, cautious of the sanctions, have started to ask their clients to provide written guarantees that no person or entity from the U.S. SDN, that's a special designated nationals list, is involved in a deal or is a beneficiary of the payment. This has resulted in delays or even rejection of money transfers to Moscow. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba will be arriving in Delhi on Thursday for a two-day official visit to, at the invitation of India's External Affairs Minister. During his visit, Kuleba will have a number of engagements including official meetings with External Affairs Minister and Deputy NSA. Discussions will be pertaining 
to the bilateral partnership and cooperation on regional and global issues of mutual interest. He is also expected to interact with the Indian business community. China's embassy in Pakistan has demanded investigations into an attack by a suicide bomber that killed Chinese engineers working on a dam project. On Tuesday, a suicide bomber rammed a vehicle into a convoy of Chinese engineers working on a dam project in northwest Pakistan, killing six people. It's the third major attack on Chinese interests in the South Asian country in a week. Six judges of the Islamabad High Court in Pakistan have sought intervention by the Supreme Judicial Council against the alleged interference of judiciary into the judiciary process by Pakistan's intelligence agency, the ISI. The judges sent a letter to the SJC demanding a judicial convention against inter-services intelligence or ISI for interference in judicial affairs and ensure that the judiciary's independence uh, remains supreme. The Supreme Judicial Council is the highest body in Pakistan authorized to take action to ensure independent functioning of the judiciary. A delegation from the European Parliament and the European Green Party spoke about democracy, international security and tensions in the Taiwan Strait. The Parliament members arrived in Taiwan on Monday and met high-level lawmakers, heads of political parties and President Tsai Ing-wen as part of a four-day visit. Claimed by China, Taiwan has no formal diplomatic ties with any European country except the Vatican. The German politician Reinhard Bodegefer, who chaired the European Parliament's Committee on Relations with China, said democratic countries should band together against authoritarian regimes. It is a fact of our times that authoritarian regimes and dictators of different colors are coordinating their efforts internationally, opposing human rights, opposing a rules-based international order. Against that backdrop, we strongly believe that it is important that team democracy works together well. The Japanese yen dropped to its lowest level against the US dollar in 34 years on Wednesday. This is the weakest that the yen has been since the mid-1990s when Japan's economy struggled after a major financial bubble burst. People in Bangkok expressed their happiness as Thailand moved closer to legalizing same-sex marriages. Thailand's lower house of parliament on Wednesday passed a marriage equality bill, a landmark step that moves Thailand closer to becoming the third Asian country to legalize same-sex unions. The bill had the support of all of Thailand's major parties and was passed by 400 of the 415 lawmakers present, with 10 voting against it. The bill now requires approval from the Senate and endorsement from the King before it becomes law. I am pleased that marriage equality legislation has passed and I hope it will be implemented because it will likely benefit many people. And now it's time to get some sporting updates as well. Two-time Olympic medalist P.V. Sindhu decimated Wen Yu Zhang of Canada in the round of 32 contests at the Madrid-Spain Masters Tournament. Last year's finalist, Sindhu progressed to the round of 16 after she secured a straight game, 21-16-21-12, over world number 49 Zhang. Sindhu, 11th in the badminton rankings, is yet to win a title on the BWF World Tour this season. Sindhu competed at the Swiss Open last week and reached the round of 16. At Madrid Spain Masters, a BWS Super 300 event, Sindhu has been seeded second behind top seed in 2016 Rio Olympic champion Karina Marin of Spain. And in tennis, world number one Novak Djokovic has ended his highly successful partnership with Croatian coach Goran Ivanisevic shortly before the clay season gets into full season. Ivanisevic joined Djokovic's team in 2019 and helped the 36-year-old win nine Grand Slam titles. As a player, Ivanisevic claimed the singles title at Wimbledon in 2001 after finishing runners-up in 1992, 1994 and 1998. 24 times major champion Djokovic said in an Instagram post, and I quote, Goran and I decided to stop working together a few weeks, a few days ago. Our chemistry on court had its up and down, ups and downs, but our friendship was always rock solid, end quote. Djokovic will gear up for the clay season as he bids to claim a fourth title at the French Open, which will take place 
from the 26th of May to the 9th of June. And World Theatre Day is an international celebration of theatre observed annually on the 27th of March each year. It serves as an occasion to promote the art of theatre and its importance in cultural expression, social dialogue and human connection. Take a look at this report. Theatre as an art form has evolved significantly over time, reflecting changes in society, technology and artistic expression. World Theatre Day highlights the value of theatre as a form of artistic expression and communication. It encourages individuals and organizations to support and promote theatre in their communities as theatre encompasses a wide range of styles, genres and cultural traditions. Theatre director Dave Fosdar and his wife tour small villages across the nation to spread the importance of theatre. World Theatre Day also serves as an opportunity for educational institutions and theatre companies to engage in outreach activities aimed at introducing people, especially youth, to the world of theatre. People should know about the theatre. They should know about the culture. They should know about the uh, like the traditional things, which we are not given in the school also. So if we know the traditional things, if I know the background, then only our culture will be promoted, then only our theatre, like our uh, like personality will be evolved. Theatre has undergone significant changes over time, but its core purpose of storytelling and human expression remains constant. With the advent of technology and its ever-changing face, theatre has faced struggle for survival amidst challenges from cinema, TV, cable and internet. That it has still managed to hold on to its special space and retain audiences speaks volumes of its reach and connect with the common man. World Theatre Day serves as a reminder of the enduring impact of theatre on society and encourages individuals to celebrate, support and engage in this rich and vibrant art form. Shama Mishra, DD India, Mumbai. And that's all we have in this edition of DD India News Hour. But do let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us uh, on Facebook, uh, X as well as Instagram. We'll be back with more news and updates as a break here on DD India. I'm Gautam Roy and from all of us here in Delhi, thanks for watching DD India News Hour.